I work as a seasonal park ranger here at Lassen National Park in California. One Friday afternoon, my brother and I, who were working together, came across a pile of scat that we thought was a goat's, but we knew it was not mountain goat feces. It looked different. We've seen mountain goats around here before, and the scat was much larger and darker in color. It appeared fresh and still kind of wet. We have no idea what this could have been. There are no other animals in the park that produce scat this large. We've also had people report to us that there is a massive black wolf in the park that's twice the size of a regular wolf. People have claimed that it had red eyes and was the size of a large, large Great Dane. And this, of course, has still been unconfirmed. I have seen a lot of strange things in the park myself that I have no explanation for what they could be. There was even a woman who had reported seeing what she referred to as Goat Man, but after going on a search, we could not find anything. Of course, as weird as it is when we go looking for these things, the woods always seem to have a way of going quiet and getting this feeling like you're being watched. Now that might just be my paranoia, but I feel a little more level-headed than letting my paranoia control me like that and just imagining things. I'm not exactly sure what all these sightings are about, and I simply don't believe they are all just simply misidentifications. And speaking of which, there is a gentleman I spoke to about seven months ago who was over on the east section of the park, and at one point or another, was actually attacked by what he describes as a bipedal coyote or wolf. He wasn't sure which. This thing actually tore aside in his tent during the nighttime while he was sleeping and attacked him. It tore his arm pretty well, and fortunately, he did not have to lose his arm, and they were able to save it. But he shot this thing right in the face multiple times until it finally fled. He said, had he not been heavily armed with his Glock, he has no idea what would have happened. He probably would not be alive. He said this creature looked evil and was very, very big. But he kept saying coyote more than wolf, and said it looked very human in the way its eyes looked. Not in the literal sense he described, but the intelligence, the intent behind what it was doing. He described it as if it was wanting to not only hurt him, but know that it wanted to hurt him. This, simply put, was just evil. I went to this kind of outdoor education boarding school when I was 14, 15 in the Victorian Alps in Australia. We hiked the mountains in that area almost every weekend, usually doing two, three night hikes, sometimes longer. We had heard from teachers and locals that there were hermits in the mountains who lived in shacks or drifted between the old cattlemen huts. We just brushed them off as stupid stories that the teachers tell you to spook you. However, we did this one hike at the tail end of winter that kind of lead me to believe there were actual hermits living in the mountains. Basically, we were doing this four-day hike at the end of winter, so it was super gloomy, foggy, and cold the whole hike. The Victorian Alps are famous for their cattlemen's huts, which are all over the high country. We would hike from hut to hut, but we rarely stayed in them because it was one of the school's rules. So we were hiking on the second day on this steep ridge, and it was mega foggy and cold. You couldn't see into the valley, only down the sloping edges of the ridge. When you're hiking long distances, you don't really talk the whole way, and since it was miserable, we all just had our heads down walking straight. Out of the corner of my eye, I thought I saw a black dog about 50 meters down the side of the ridge. It wasn't a dingo because it was jet black and had a collar on. Looked kinda like a border collie. I had only just registered it was a dog in my mind when I swear I saw a man walking behind the dog. He looked homeless and was looking up at us. Bear in mind, it was really foggy and this guy was darting in and out of trees. I turned around and told my mate I saw a dude and his dog on the trail below. He was still visible so I pointed him out and my mate freaked a little too and told everyone else to look. In the moment of getting my group six guys to stop hiking and all look, he was gone. Everyone other than myself and my mate who saw him shrugged it off as a day hiker and his dog. We joked it was a hermit, but didn't speak about it much after. We arrived at our campsite, which was the Vallejo Gartner hut. We couldn't stay in the hut, so we set up camp on the flat ground around it. We set up, 
cooked dinner and got ready to sleep. I didn't think much about the man and dog I saw earlier, but now it was getting dark it kind of crept into my mind. There is this awesome toilet at this hut that overlooks the valley below. Honestly an awesome shitter. It was almost dark and I need a shit so I headed to the loo. As I was sitting there and looking at the view, I was feeling a little creeped out, I don't know why. Now one thing to note is that these huts are all covered in scribbles and people's names, little sayings, etc. Like literally every square inch is covered in something. So off cue never really read anything on the walls if you stay at these huts like every weekend. Though as I reached for the toilet paper, these words literally jumped out at me. Run. Run. He's coming. Run. I never wiped my ass faster. Combined with what I had seen earlier and my creepy feeling, I just bolted out of the bathroom into my tent. The guy I was tenting with actually was the one who had also seen the dude, so I told him what I saw in the bathroom. We both became pretty paranoid and just sort of laid there for hours not making a sound. Eventually, I went to sleep. Shit really gets weird when the next day we woke up to find huge portions of our food missing. We keep the food in the outside bit of our tents in our hiking packs and then inside zipped bags. Half of my group's outside tent flies were undone with the packs open and food bags were strewn over the ground. We thought it was a wombat originally, but the bags were literally unzipped and our hiking packs had buckles to open them. My thinking was the dude I saw earlier was a hermit and followed us to our camp and stole our food at night. Honestly creepiest shit I have ever experienced. I was hunting in a forest during gun season in Michigan in the early 2000s. My spot was the far edge of a swamp. To get to it I walked a trail that sort of cut through the middle past this huge gnarled dead tree. Its limbs curled like a dead hand reaching towards the sky. It was straight from a horror movie. This particular morning the fog was out but not horribly thick. I reach this tree and I'm panning the flashlight looking out over the swamp. I see this talk black shadow running through the swamp. It looked like a humanoid figure and faded after a few seconds. I scream at the top of my lungs as I see this figure and then nothing. I reach my cousin who was 100 yards away on the FRS radio and he said he never heard my scream. Last time I was away sailing, we docked for the night, fair enough. It had been a long day on the open waters, and the peacefulness of the marina was a welcome change. The sun had just dipped below the horizon, casting a warm orange hue across the sky as we secured the boat and prepared to unwind. I was just chilling above deck with one of my buds aboard, the gentle lapping of the water against the hull creating a soothing background melody. The cool breeze rustled my hair, and the scent of the salt water mingled with the faint aroma of dinner being prepared in the galley below. It was the kind of tranquil evening that made all the challenges of sailing worthwhile. And then, as if a switch had been flipped, the serenity was shattered. The water around us started rippling towards the boat, rocking it slightly. At first, we exchanged puzzled glances, wondering if it was some strange phenomenon caused by the tide or a passing ship. But the ripples grew stronger, more pronounced, and there was an undeniable sense of movement beneath us. My heart quickened, and I shot a bewildered look at my friend. Do you see that? I stammered, my voice tinged with a mixture of excitement and trepidation. He nodded, his eyes wide with a mix of curiosity and concern. Yeah, something's not right. We gave the area a quick glance over, searching for any logical explanation. Maybe it was just an underwater current playing tricks on us. But our rationalizations were cut short when we heard a faint whispering, like a soft breeze carrying distant voices. Unease settled over us as we exchanged another glance, our senses heightened. Without a word, we decided to go grab some snacks from the galley and return to the deck, our curiosity getting the better of us. That's when we saw them, the source of the unsettling phenomenon. Shadow figures, haunting and ethereal, emerged from the water like wraiths. Transparent holes for eyes stared through us, their forms shifting and morphing as if they were made of smoke and mist. It was terrifying. 
My heart raced and my breath caught in my throat as I tried to make sense of what we were witnessing. Were these apparitions lost souls from some long forgotten maritime tragedy? Or was there some natural explanation that had eluded us? The figures didn't move quickly. They drifted with an eerie, deliberate slowness. It was as if they were studying us just as intensely as we were studying them. My mind raced, considering whether we should attempt to communicate or retreat to the safety of the cabin. But the decision was made for us when the figures began to advance, their ghostly forms gliding over the water's surface. Panic surged through me, my instincts screaming that this was a danger beyond comprehension. Without a second thought, my friend and I bolted, practically tripping over each other in our haste to get back inside the cabin. The boat's engine roared to life, and we powered away from the marina, putting distance between ourselves and the inexplicable encounter. My heart pounded in my chest as we sped through the dark waters, the night air echoing with our ragged breaths. As we finally slowed to a safer distance, we turned to look back at the marina. The shadow figures were gone, faded into the night like a twisted dream. We exchanged a shaky glance, our minds struggling to process the surreal events we had just witnessed. We never found out what those shadow figures were, or if anyone else had ever experienced such a haunting encounter. But one thing was certain that night would forever be etched into our memories, a chilling reminder that the mysteries of the sea run far deeper than we could ever fathom. One evening my radio had kicked in with someone else reporting that they had seen the same thing I had, something that I'll never forget. This thing that I saw scared me half to death, that's for sure. I was working the evening shift, patrolling the watershed and keeping an eye out for people who may or may not be illegally fishing. I was hiking up along a creek. This creek feeds into a river, and I saw a large, dark, furry thing by some trees across from where my patrol vehicle was parked. It stood as still as a tree, its arms raised slightly, at its size like it was sniffing the air and stretching. It had to have been over eight feet tall, judging by where it was standing by a tree, and built like a linebacker wide shoulders and chest tapering down to its slender hips. I could see muscles tensing along its legs as it crouched slightly. I was startled and immediately thought of the people I'd encountered on duty before usually drunk kids and groups of teens getting rowdy around campfires. But this time, this was something entirely different, something inexplicable, and all alone out here in the middle of nowhere, with no backup. I didn't think I froze in place, hoping that it had not seen me, while I studied the bushes where it was crouching, waiting for it to move again. That's when my radio started buzzing with the other rangers reporting seeing the same thing. That's when this thing took off running, full speed, into the woods. I could see along the side of it where I was standing on top of a hill overlooking the river valley. It disappeared quickly behind some trees, ran like nothing I'd ever seen before powerful strides, moving its legs back and forth in giant leaps, up the hills towards town. But not before stopping long enough to look straight at me without ever slowing down. It had green eyes that shone bright in the night, I was terrified from this, and I still have no way to explain what sort of animal this was. My ranking was Staff Sergeant E6, and I was in charge of a security firewatch platoon. We handled perimeter defense on the flight line and security at the Squadron Operations Center. We also managed the odd green sheep patrol on base after dark, looking for would-be intruders. This part of my story occurred back in the 1960s. I served with the 8th Tactical Fighter Wing at the Yuban Air Base in Thailand. At the time, I was a replacement airman fresh from the USA and not long in country. The squadron to which I was assigned had just turned over almost all of its aircraft to the 388th TFW, which took our F-4DS, including my platoon's aircraft, and sent us back to the USA. My unit only had five F-4CS left in the country, so I was not going anywhere soon. I had some time on my hands. We were on the flight line about midnight, minding our own business when an airman came screaming out of the night, heading toward us from across the flight line. 
I thought he was a fire marshal or an airman on fire watch, checking to see if anybody was out by the flight line. I couldn't understand why he needed to run though. He ran up to us and was gasping for breath. He told us that we had been on fire watch during the flight line, and he saw something out over the end of the runway 1 on 129. He said it was a bright reddish orange object that came in from the west, slowly across the field to the east. It hovered for a short time above an aircraft revetment area before slowly drifting out of view to the south. He said he stood in disbelief for a few seconds until it came back out from behind some trees. He said it was this time it slowly moved toward him and hovered over building 7357, also known as the AGE hangar. We refueled our aircraft with JP-4, he said. It looked like a huge fireball with a greenish-bluish hue glow around it. He said he could see rivets in the object and what looked like a dome on top. It was about the size of an F-4C, which was about 53 feet long with a wingspan of 38 feet. He said the dome was about 20 feet in diameter, and it had some kind of windows or ports on each side. He said it had stayed there for a short time before slowly turning to the south and disappearing behind some trees. We radioed flight control about our Firewatch Airmen's report, but they said they had not reported anything unusual. They told us to keep an eye out for anything suspicious, but there was nothing else until about an hour later. There was an airman on duty at the AGE hangar who had just relieved his replacement. He radioed flight control and he thought there was a small fire inside the AGE hangar. At first, they did not believe him. There were no reports of any aircraft being in the area. After about five minutes, they told him to call us for assistance. When we arrived, our Firewatch airman was already there and said that he had seen the object in question, that it was hovering over the AGE hangar when he first saw it. He said it came out from behind the trees and was hovering over building 7357 like before, and he saw it for a second time. There was definitely something strange going on. We entered the hangar and saw a glow in the corners. We pulled our fire extinguishers off of our jeep and headed into the hangar. It was still too dark to make out much, but we could see a reddish-orange glow emanating. We could feel the intense heat, even though we were only 50 feet away. The section chief was already in there with his extinguishers and managed to knock down the glow. The fire was coming from a 12-foot deep vent in the floor, which was shielded by a steel grate. The fire marshal went over to the hot grate, and it became red hot when he touched it. We all stood there in disbelief. We would later learn that the fire marshal had already pulled up the two great sidebars when he first saw the flames. We called flight control, and they sent coverall crews to help us with opening all the aircraft revetments to see if there were any fires in the adjacent aircraft. We found nothing that night, but it turned out to be a very eventful one for all of us. We never reported our lights in the sky sightings to anybody else that I know of. But the next morning, while eating breakfast, I informed my wife that there was a bright reddish-orange object in the sky heading toward Grand Forks at FB from the west. I never saw it, but she said it was very bright and that it appeared to be a trail of some kind behind it that was warping space and time. These were her words. I don't know if the sighting had anything to do with the fire in the AGE hangar that night, but I feel it is important enough to report this incident after all these years. I'm an old soldier now, retired from the U.S. Army after 20 years of active duty with two wars under my belt. I am also a former member of the U.S. Army Security Agency and was honorably discharged as an intercept operator. I would also really like to know if anybody else has had similar sightings or knew of this happening at Grand Forks during the 1960s. I hope somebody out there in the UFO community reads this and can shed some light on this very strange incident in my life. Back in 2016, I was in Virginia and my mom had gone through a pretty messy breakup. At the time, but we made the most of it by doing what we did, like hiking. She introduced me to her friend and her husband and children. Which one was a female my age cute girl? Off topic. It was a trail in the Blue Ridge part of the Appalachians. 
That day we were going to do old rag, but got there too late. During some points we would all be split up and sometimes I would be way back or way front. With this experience I was way in front of everyone, even the dog. Off topic again. One part of the trip we had stopped and rested at an overlook. Then we went on our way. We were about another, I say, 15 to 30 minutes into it, and I was way ahead. I remembered warnings from signs my mom, her friend, her husband, and another person that there was bears. But what I heard that day wasn't a bear. It walked on two legs and I was too far in front of everyone for it to be them. Besides, I would have heard the dog walking too since the cute girl was walking it behind me. I felt the sense of being watched when I heard the leaves crunching I believe in Bigfoot and the paranormal and I'm up for suggestions on what it was, it could have been Bigfoot or the rake I'm into all that folklore. I've got more stories that I want to share I just gotta get my internet shell off. My ex-husband may have seen a skinwalker one night. He worked the overnight shift in the big city of Santa Fe, New Mexico. Well, Santa Fe is bigger than the small village we were from that had two lane roads to travel to get to the main highways. He would leave our house at 10 p.m. to get to work by 11 p.m. One night I got a frantic call from him when he arrived at work. He sounded almost hysterical. He said he was driving down the usual road to get to the highway and came up to what he thought was a cow sitting in the middle of the road like they do sometimes. He slammed his brakes on and honked his horn annoyed that he was going to be late. He waited a bit and honked again and the cow stood up, and but he realized it was standing up in its hind legs. Then he realized it wasn't a cow, maybe it was a coyote or a wolf. He then saw that it was a naked man as it turned to face him, but the head was of a dog. The creature slammed its hands on the hood of the car and then bound off into the hills in three steps. He couldn't make out where it went, but my ex said he drove as fast as he possibly could to get out of the area and to the well-lit highway. Once he arrived at work 20 minutes later, he called me nit making much sense. When he calmed down a bit, we both tried to make out what he possibly could have seen. Even years later, we'd talk about it once in a while, maybe a dog man, maybe a drunken man wearing a mask. It wasn't until years later we came up with the possibility of a skinwalker. Maybe it was just some distortion of the darkness and headlights during late night driving. Maybe he was hypnotized by the driving, but he still thinks he saw something out of the ordinary. I've been avidly having nightmares of someone being in my small town living trailer for quite some time. I had nothing of it to actually say anything. Until now. A week leading up to this, I had a sleep paralysis moment where I've seen someone in my house and a co-worker stabilize me because I had a seizure in my dream, I think. Because I was convulsing foam and shit like a regular seizing victim. I remember my ex that used to live in this place by herself, saying she used to have nightmares and dreams of a person breaking in or being here. I never had resentment to that statement because we're Navajos. In the following months, I've been having nightmares of someone in my home. I'm always in a sleep paralysis moment. Until the other night, I see a person's silhouette from both windows and began to panic because it's at both front and back door. I called my parents and grandma but get no answer. So I called my aunt and she picked up the phone, questioned whatever was going on, and I explained to her the events. Now at this point I'm mad because it's causing me stress. So I told her I'm going to go outside and fight it. She told me otherwise and stay inside. A couple weekends ago, my boyfriend and I went up to the North Carolina mountains to a cabin. The cabin was close to Silva and Maggie Valley. I don't want to say the exact location because the post might get deleted. The cabin is in the Smoky Mountains. My boyfriend is older than me by quite a bit, and he had been going to this cabin for his whole life. He told me a story about a man who knew when he was younger, and this was back in the old logging days. The man was named Joe and was very familiar with the woods and was an outdoorsman. One day Joe went in the woods and got lost, 
which is very unusual for him because he knows the woods like the back of his hands. He became very disoriented, and as he was trying to find his way home, a cottonmouth snake came out of nowhere and bit him in the eye. He eventually got out of the woods and returned home. Joe was known to be a very sweet man and would give you the clothes off his back. That kind of person. However, right after the incident, Joe became very mean aggressive, not like his nature at all. After a little while, Joe just disappeared without a trace. Shortly after this, a couple of the neighbors also disappeared without trace, as well as of the neighbor's livestock. Fast forward, my boyfriend, while he was still young, was enjoying a campfire with his friends. In the woods, they heard what he said sounded like someone hitting a tree with a cane. The thuds were very precise and came in series of threes. Example, thud, 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 silence thud, thud, thud. They joked around and said it might be Joe. Fast forward to present day, my boyfriend and I are at the cabin. He had told me these stories at the campfire. Maybe he was just trying to scare me and made these up, but I thought it kind of sounded like a windigo was behind the disappearances. Anyways, one night as we were sitting on the couch, and I heard what sounded like something tapping at one of the windows. The next day in the afternoon, we were sitting on the couch watching TV. We then heard what sounded like something very, very heavy on the roof, except it didn't sound like something walking. It's harder to describe, but it kind of just would make like two knocking sounds stop and then do it again. Later that night as we were in bed, I couldn't sleep, so I was on my phone. I heard what I thought I was talking and I listened harder, and it was actually chickens that I heard. They were making that little warble sound that they do. I thought this was kind of weird because while there were chickens that came from the neighbor's house the other day when he was grilling, I didn't think chickens were nocturnal. Maybe they are. A few minutes after I stopped hearing the chickens, my boyfriend, who I didn't realize it was awake, started complaining how he couldn't sleep and decided to go to the car to find some Benadryl he left in it. I followed him, and while I didn't go outside with him, I stood on the porch and watched him. There were no chickens outside, and I didn't hear any at all. Maybe this is all just my imagination going crazy, but when I did hear the sounds, I pretended not to. I didn't really want to take chances. Could this have been a windigo? Was my imagination just running wild? From the stories I heard about Joe and people disappearing and the sounds I heard, I thought maybe it could be. My setting occurred in the year of 2011. In April, if I recall correctly, in the jungles of Indonesia. I was a sergeant at the time of my experience and expressed a desire to be posted in the jungle. It was known that I had jungle warfare training, so it wasn't too hard to convince my superiors that this would be a good idea. I was stationed at an army base just outside of a small town in Indonesia. The town is called Dumai. The base was on the coast, and the nearest town to the base is a small village called Bahau, and that's right around where the sighting took place. During my posting in April of 2011, I was preparing to participate in a jungle warfare exercise with my unit. I had just finished conducting reconnaissance on the objective and was returning back to base when I first saw the creature. I was roughly about a kilometer away from the base and was on a road that linked to Baja. It's a road that I'd taken many times before. The surrounding area was mainly filled with thick jungle, but it wasn't hard to spot open spaces between. We were moving along this road when I saw an open space roughly 150 meters in front of me. I looked through the trees and saw something that I can only describe as a dragon. The creature was on the ground, its wings folded next to its body. It had a long, slender neck ridged by spines that extended back to its skull. It was gray in color with dim orange patches on the side of its neck and toward the end of its tail. I was going around 35 miles an hour when I first saw it, slamming on the brakes, skidding to a stop when I reached the spot where it was sitting. I never found out what this thing was. It just went away as soon as I saw it. It was unresponsive to my presence and seemed unconcerned by me. I didn't tell anybody else about it. 
It didn't seem right to report something that I had no concrete proof of. It was just my word against other people's. How, if someone even tried to tell me this, I'd call them a liar. I still didn't believe my own sighting. The really weird thing is that I've been to Bahau before and never once saw anything strange. I'm an open-minded person. If it wasn't for the fact that I had gone to Bahau before and never seen anything strange, I would think that I was going nuts. What was it? I want to state a few things. This incident takes place around one, two years ago. Initially, I wanted to post my encounter somewhere online, but the more I thought about this encounter, the more it consumed me and my thoughts. Sometime after the fact, I figured the best thing for myself was to try and forget. This didn't work, so instead I'll do my best to lay out what I saw. I live in North Carolina. It's not a small city by any means, but it's a highway town at its core. I've lived here for 10 plus years. On the night in question, I was with my ex. We'll refer to her as Z. This was right around the time when C-19 restrictions had yet to be fully lifted, so Z invited me for a walk. She was finishing up her online courses for the semester, one being physical activity, so we'd often walk around her neighborhood to reach a daily amount of steps. Anyways, we head out on this walk. It's around 7-8 p.m., so on our way out the sun is already setting. We stick to the street, as it isn't a sidewalk, and we're just walking through the neighborhood. I've been down this area hundreds of times. I drove there nearly every day to be with Z during the pandemic. It's just your average single-story cookie cutter. Every house looks identical neighborhood. On our way back to the house, it's dusk. A weird time of day, especially on this evening. It was almost a gray-looking atmosphere, but still illuminated enough to see the streets. Z is on a phone call for the entirety of the way back, so I'm just taking in my surroundings and waiting for the walk to be finished. That's when I see it. Whatever this thing was. About three houses down, mid-jump, arms and legs fully outstretched and leaping across the street. It lands on the other side in an instant, with barely enough time to register that anything had even happened at all. At the time it felt like a hallucination, something fiction that my brain had just conjured up out of boredom or lack of visual content. It happened so quickly, but this flash frame is burned into my memory now and is something that I'll probably never forget. It was huge and 100% silent. I only caught sight of it flying across the street and landing underneath a car. It was fully outstretched and took up almost the entirety of the street. Even with its hands on the ground, its rear legs were still stretched from the jump and extended far beyond the halfway point of this two-lane road. I can only guess the size of this thing was from 10-20 feet in length. It looked extremely thin beyond anorexic, but startlingly human from the waist up. 100 percent dark gray. Its arms seemed to be car length, with large claws, and its legs were bowed in a way that reminded me of a dog. The only feature I couldn't make out was its face. It seemed completely black, but scarily human. Again, at the time I had no idea if what I saw was some sort of weird animal or just a hallucination. Even so, I kept my eyes glued to where I had seen this hallucination land. As I got closer and closer to the car, I almost wanted to freak out. Z was still on the phone though, so I decided to keep quiet and inspect the car for myself as we walked by. I turned my head as we slowly passed by the vehicle. At this point, I'm convincing myself that what I had seen couldn't be possible, but I just couldn't bring myself to peer and look underneath that car. As we walk away, I turn back a few times really trying to process if I lost my mind for a moment or not. By the time we get home, I feel almost embarrassed. Did I just have a stare down with a car for absolutely no reason? By the time we walk inside, Z's house, she's off the phone. We were kind of bummed that our walk was void of conversation, so we just catch up and converse for the next half hour. The hallucination had almost completely left my mind at this point. We just ended up going about our usual business. Honestly, I was just happy to be spending time with my partner. 
I was ready to accept that what had happened earlier was nothing more than my imagination. I had forgotten about the experience almost entirely, until Z asked me something out of nowhere. Did you see something jump across the street earlier? I went on a night hike about 12 years ago with a meetup group, just to experience one. I knew no one there and I'm not one to make small talk. There were about 25 people there and beforehand we met in, in a small cabin on the property where the organizer laid down the rules. This person was stern. We were to remain completely silent and listen to the night sounds. Keep up with the leader. It was certainly creepy, walking quickly and quietly through the dark woods with strangers at your back. I think the leader was too rigid and no one seemed to enjoy the experience. As soon as I spotted my car, I got in it and left. I'm 18 years old and recently graduated from high school. There have been some unexplained things going on in my home ever since we moved in last year. My younger brother was in his room carrying out a conversation which was weird because we were alone at home. I went to see who he was talking to. There was no one there, so I asked him who he was talking to. He said the little girl with the black eyes. I asked where she was and he said that she had left. I thought he just lying. About a week later, we started hearing voices and footsteps. I would be sleeping with my blankets covering me, and I would wake up with them folded at the bottom of my bed. My sister got scared one night and crawled into bed with me. As she was getting into my bed, I woke up, so I turned on my TV. I also turned on my light to find the remote. I left the light on along with the TV. Right when we were both drifting off to sleep, my door slammed shut, which is almost impossible as I always have a basket full of books in front of the door so that it doesn't close. The light then shut off, and my TV picture went off with static noise. I got up and went to the door. I tried to open it, but it was like someone was holding the door handle from the outside. My sister and I started to scream when my mom came and opened the door. As she did, the light turned back on and the TV picture came back. We had a priest bless the house, but the activity continues. The house was built in 23 and no one has died there. Can you tell us what we need to do? Under the haunting glow of the moon, a pall of fear enveloped the Navajo tribe for a malevolent skinwalker roamed amongst us a creature born of an ancient curse that left our settlement in the grip of terror. As the unsettling whispers echoed through our community, my heart, as a young warrior named Raki, felt a calling, an ancestral beckoning to confront the source of our dread. Guided by the spirits and stories passed down through generations, I embarked on a perilous journey to a sacred ground in the heart of present-day Oklahoma. Legend spoke of an ancient totem concealed in that hallowed place, an artifact believed to be a summoning ground for the Wendigo, the very entity empowering the malevolent skinwalker. The path was treacherous, winding through rugged terrain, guided only by the luminous stars above. The night air carried an ominous weight, and the distant howls of coyotes seemed to harmonize with the unsettling wind. Yet, with each step, I clung to the tales of my ancestors, allowing their echoes to guide me toward the heart of the darkness that had befallen us. Sensing the presence of the Wendigo long before I reached the sacred ground, I felt its malevolence weaving through the shadows. The creature, in its deceptive nature, took on various formed shadows dancing in the moonlight, echoes of unseen footsteps, and eerie calls that reverberated through the night. Yet my Navajo spirit, forged in the crucible of ancient tales and warrior teachings, would not waver. The Wendigo's attempts to instill fear only fueled the fire within me, transforming my apprehension into a steely resolve. Each step toward the sacred ground brought forth a symphony of fear and anticipation. As I neared the ancient totem, standing tall like a silent sentinel, the air thickened with an otherworldly energy. The Wendigo, growing desperate, intensified its attempts to unsettle me. Shadows twisted, and the night seemed to come alive with unseen malevolence. Yet I pressed on undeterred. The confrontation unfolded beneath the silent gaze of the stars. 
The Wendigo emerged, a monstrous embodiment of fear and hunger, eyes glowing with an unnatural fire. Armed with my ancestral axe, passed down through generations, I faced the creature head-on, engaging in a battle that transcended the physical and delved into the spiritual. With a surge of strength and determination, I hurled my axe toward the ancient totem. The clash echoed through the night, a symphony of ancestral spirits colliding with the malevolence of the Wendigo. In that pivotal moment, the totem crumbled, and the Wendigo's guttural cry filled the air as its form dissipated into the ethereal void. Silence descended upon the sacred ground, the remnants of the curse carried away by the winds. Iraqi stood amidst the ruins of the totem triumphant. The Wendigo's terror faded like a distant nightmare, and a profound calm settled upon the land. The Navajo tribe would know peace once more, and the legend of Raki, the warrior who faced the shadows, would resonate in fireside tales for generations to come. I would like to make it clear that this encounter was not with a Yi Nalbushii. However, it involves an indigenous medicine man who claimed to shape shift into an animal. I share this story in this subreddit in case readers are interested in skinwalker adjacent activities outside of the Navajo Nation. But if this is not the right place, I understand as I do not wish to disrespect the dying culture. When I was living in Mexico in the mid 2000s, I was enrolled in a beginner's Reiki workshop. I was a teenager then, very curious about spiritual practices, but also very naive. After one of our sessions, the instructor told me that a native medicine man, who was also a natural shapeshifter, was going to host an event in our city. I begged my mom to take me to meet this man, and she agreed. We arrived at the hotel where the event was taking place, where I was introduced to this man, who called himself Night Jaguar. He was a very normal-looking man who appeared to be in his early fifties, and he was very friendly and easy to talk to. I don't remember much of our conversation, but it involved mentioning places where medicine people and witches would gather for ceremonies. Before the conversation ended, he asked if I could provide him with my home address. In my naivete, I gave him my address, and he provided me with his email so we could keep in touch. I was thrilled with the idea of communicating and possibly learning from a Nahuel medicine man, but I never heard from him again. It seemed like that was the end of it, until weeks later my dad storms into my room and tells me that he forbids me from talking to that damned Nahuel again. At this point I had given up on hearing from Night Jaguar, and I didn't understand why my dad would think we had been keeping in touch when we have not. I replied with okay while wondering what was that all about. A long time had gone by when my dad told me what had led to his imposed moratorium on contacting Night Jaguar. One night, shortly after meeting Night Jaguar and giving him my address, my dad woke up from a deep sleep, feeling quite disturbed. In his own words, he felt as if there was a large and dangerous animal in his bedroom. One thing to know about my dad is that he has a keen sixth sense, he can see and feel energies around him, and although he couldn't see what was in the bedroom, he could feel that it was just observing, but more disturbingly, the energy was especially interested in my mom, who was asleep next to my dad. Being unable to go back to sleep, my dad just got up and told whatever was there that he could feel it, and that he knew what it was up to. The activity did not escalate and left soon after. Since my dad knew about my meeting with Night Jaguar, he deduced that the Nahuel was the source of the energy in the bedroom. Fortunately, that energy did not return after that night. After my dad shared about his encounter, I felt immense guilt as I placed my family in potential danger by foolishly giving our address to a complete stranger, Nahuel or not. My family was lucky that the Nahuel left us alone after that, I have read and heard about what kind of harm a witch and or a Nahuel is capable of inflicting to families for a long period of time. Some people in Mexico believe that shapeshifters can be good or evil, but after my family's encounter, I am weary of trusting anyone who claims to be capable of shape shifting into an animal. If they are anything like Ye Nald Lucii, I wish to stay far away from them. 
If you made it to the end of the story, thank you for your time. I have been wanting to share this story for a while now. If you have any questions about this encounter, feel free to ask. July of 1995, we were dropped off to survive with a fixed amount of rations within the Pine Barrens of New Jersey. I was a new Marine. My fire team consisted of four other Marines, one Navy corpsman, and three enlisted Marines. The first night, I sent one of our group out to set up a watch rotation. The next day, he comes back scared as heck, shivering and wide-eyed. He refused to tell us what happened, so we forced him. He said he saw a thing as tall in the trees, covered in hair, with big arms and red eyes. Our corpsman immediately set up a watch with him on it. That night, the corpsman went out to relieve whoever was on watch. As soon as he was out of sight, the corpsman comes sprinting back into our camp, wide-eyed and terrified. The look on his face when he said, you're not going to believe this, told us all we needed to know. That night, I got on watch and he told me the story. He said that as soon as it was his turn to keep watch, he noticed a pair of red eyes a couple of feet from him. Whatever it was, it kept looking at the corpsman and growling. What happened next is a little fuzzy for me after all this time, but the corpsman said he couldn't see it anymore when his flashlight caught its eyes. He said that it was making these growling noises, was large and black, and a big black cat or a bear of some kind. The night the corpsman went out to relieve whoever was on watch, as soon as he was out of sight, the corpsman comes sprinting back into our camp, wide-eyed and terrified. The look on his face when he said, you're not going to believe this, told us all we needed to know. That night, I got on watch and he told me the story. He said that as soon as it was his turn to keep watch, he saw a pair of red eyes a couple of feet from him. Whatever it was, I kept looking at the corpsman and growling. What happened next is a little fuzzy for me after all this time, but the corpsman said he couldn't see it anymore when his flashlight caught its eyes. He said that it was making these growling noises, was big, black, and bear-like. He said it stayed right next to him the whole time, and when it stood up, he stood up. He said when he turned to run back to our camp, it began coming after him. He said the closer it got, the more he began running. He said he ran all the way back to our camp in record time. I remember us laughing because there was no way something could have chased him back. Well, the next day, we all went to look for tracks. It turned out that whatever it was, it was as tall as a man, and it had three toed paw prints and really long claws on its toes. It may have been a bear, I don't know. After that, we never heard anything else, and we were all fine. We even saw the Navy corpsman a little while ago, and he remembered it like it was yesterday. So anyway, we're all fine and we're out there, and the Navy corpsman goes out to relieve whoever is on watch again. Now it's the third day, so I'm kind of out of it at this point. I mean, we're seeing a lot of deer and turkey and other signs that there's wildlife here, so that's a good thing. While the corpsman is out there, everything's fine and dandy. We're all just sitting around talking about what we would do when we got out. The more I think about it, the more I wonder where he is. Just as some of us are about to stand up and go look for him, the dude who was on watch comes sprinting into our camp, saying that something's right behind him. We all look at each other and ask him what he's meaning, and that's when we all hear the growl. It sounds like a bear, but much deeper, like a weird kind of bear that I've never heard before. It is very deep like the sound you hear in the movies when there's a monster. What came next is something I'll never forget. It reminded me of when my grandpa showed me the Jersey Devil stories when I was a kid. We all drew our guns and waited for whatever it was to come into full view. We're all looking around for it. Then we see the corpseman. He's running toward us from his post, but there's something big and black following him. We all start yelling and the run faster. Whatever was following him was not stopping. It looked almost like a large cat chasing a mouse, but a cat in humanoid form. It was the same height as the corpseman when it stood up. It was taller than any of us. The next thing I remember is seeing something black pass in front of me. Then everything began moving slowly. 
It was like a scene in a movie where time slows down and all the details are there. I could finally make out what was chasing him. It came into view. It was black, it was hairy, and had wings. I can't remember seeing any arms or not, but if they were, they were smaller compared to the rest of its body. Its face was feline-like, having reddish-yellow eyes glowing. Then I saw its hands. They were almost backward, but had very long claws. In fact, they were most likely like talons, just very large. It kept running toward us, and the closer it got, the more noise it made. It was like this really loud hissing mixed with howling. Just as it got closer to the corpseman, he tripped. He said something about seeing its claws going after him right before he fell. Right when the corpseman tripped, it flew up into the air. It started coming down fast. When it was just a few feet from him, I remember that's when we got to him. There was blood everywhere. The thing was pissed and now dove down at one of us while trying to retrieve his body. I don't know if it was trying to take him back to its lair or wherever it is, but we're not going to let that happen. It dove at one of us, but we shot it down before it could touch him. But there was a lot of blood on the ground where he had been laying. After we shot it, it let out the scream and dove off into the trees away from us. We used this moment to grab his body, pulling him back to our camp to attend to him. I remember talking about it with some of the other guys after the incident. We all believed that the thing was not from this world. We also remember what the corpseman said right before he was taken. He was screaming but eventually passed away due to blood loss within minutes of this thing tearing him open. The only thing he managed to say before his death was, it didn't get me. Our training mission was then aborted within hours after this happened. We will never forget what happened that evening, and we all wanted answers. I can't remember why but I have a feeling someone on our team knew what it was that took him down. It was so dark. I think one of our team members saw something. We were all wondering what it was that attacked us. I'm fairly certain that what we had encountered was indeed a Jersey Devil. I can't be sure, but I have this feeling we lost a good soldier that day. Don't let anybody feel with these fake stories that they're harmless. He was torn open and bled out. This was no ghost or folklore. The man's gone. It's an event none of us will forget. Personally, I won't step foot in the Pine Barrens again after all this. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.